Thank you very much. So I obviously realize those in this room um, have really amazing teeth. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm Daryl Edwards and um, I basically, you know how people, a lot of people hate to exercise? Uh, well, I, my job is to help people overcome their fear of exercise and to fall in love with movement again. And sorry about this, my clicker is not working. Go. So a, little, a few things about me. Uh, I'm a health coach. I'm a certified personal trainer and also a nutritionist. This is one of my clients. A 12-week transformation, movement, uh, good food, and other lifestyle changes. Uh, uh, another client of mine. This is a, a one-year transformation. Um, this young man hadn't exercised since he was 11 years old because he was told by his doctor, because he wasn't producing any adrenaline uh, naturally, he was told by his doctor that if he exercised, he could die within seconds. And when I met him, he, he showed him the dog tag that he had to have on him. And I said, we'll get you exercising, we'll get you moving. And this was a transformation after 12 months. Uh, here's another 12-week transformation. Um, this lady did extremely well, again, uh, a diet of movement and good food and lifestyle choices. I'm also an author, Paleo Fitness, Paleo from A to Z, uh, an introduction to Paleo Fitness, and also I have a free ebook on the importance of play, available for download if you go to primalplay.com. So I know everyone here loves stats, and some of you have seen some of these slides before. Um, the dangers of high fructose corn syrup. Well, there is a relationship between running into a tree and dying and high fructose corn syrup consumption. And there, there is, there really is. And this data comes from the USDA and the National Vital Statistics reports. Uh, so, and as we're all aware, correlation is not causation, but this is being tracked over 10 years, and there's quite a strong relationship between those sets of data. Uh, why is cheese not safe, safe to consume? Why should we avoid dairy? Arguably, it's because you're more likely to be strangled by your bread sheets if you consume cheese. And again, this data you can verify. It comes from the USDA, and the CDC over a 10-year period, and uh, that is the actual data. Um, cage and specific cause mortality. Again, some of you know I no longer watch Nicolas Cage movies. Why? Because you're more likely to die by drowning um, in a swimming pool, okay? And <laughs> yeah, so I, do no, I no longer watch Nicolas Cage movies and I avoid swimming pools, just in case I do. So the seriousness about this is that we can present data and we can be fairly convincing in our arguments, but we need to spend time validating that data and questioning that data, because I could be saying any, anything to try and convince you of my arguments. So I would ask you to please don't take anything for granted. What we do know is that we're suffering from a chronic lifestyle disease epidemic. And up to 75% of us will die prematurely from a chronic lifestyle disease globally. And, and we kind of know what, what that is, you know, issues with cholesterol and triglycerides, or stroke, chronic low back pain, cancer, blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, obesity, arthritis, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis. Um, and even if we're relatively healthy now, we probably know people who fall into this category. Uh, we may have lost those close to us uh, based on uh, one or more of these diseases. Um, and very few of us are the 25% who will live, live a long and healthy life. So I'm gonna be presenting the case for exercise, the case of physical activity. You are the judge and jury, I'll be presenting some evidence, and you can make a decision as to whether my arguments are sound. So here I've got a, a few quotes. Walking is the best medicine. Uh, that which is used develops. 
that which isn't used, the waste away. Uh, we need the right amount of nourishment and exercise. Look well to the spine for the cause of disease. Eating alone will not keep a man well. You must also take exercise. And if you're in a bad mood, go for a walk. If you're still in a bad mood, go for another walk. Um, and do you know what? This, these quotes are attributed to Hippocrates. Um, but what the heck does he know about good health, hey? Eh? <laughs> so, um, but it's really interesting. The amount of Hippocrates quotes I see tend to gravitate towards food. All disease begins in the gut. Let food be thy medicine, let medicine be thy food. But there's a significant amount of quotes in relation to physical activity and the benefits of physical activity. So, London double-decker bus. Um, Jeremy Morris, 1953, published a paper in The Lancet looking at different occupations and the risk of cardiovascular disease. And he found that comparing bus drivers with bus conductors, and the main difference between the two populations were bus drivers were sedentary for 90% of their working day. Uh, they were sitting. Um, they had twice the risk of early death in comparison to bus conductors who were climbing 600 stairs a day. They were walking back and forth on the length of the bus. They were helping passengers on and off the bus and had a third decreased risk of heart disease and they were more likely to survive a cardiovascular event. And um, he started to look at other occupations, comparing postal workers with civil servants at their desks and he basically discovered that there's a, a high likelihood a premature death just based on sedentary activity alone. So with the same type of diet, the same type of you know, uh, other lifestyle habits like smoking and so on, levels of poverty and the like, the main difference in relation to these studies were physical activity. So what about obesity? Does exercise really make a difference? I argue with a lot of people online <laughs> about the fact that exercise of the right type can actually be really beneficial when it comes to sustainable weight loss. And often people say, no, no, it's 80% food, 20% what you do uh, in the gym, it's 50-50, it's actually m all about food. What does the ev evidence say? Well, most papers comparing diet versus exercise, there's one interesting fact about those comparisons. Usually the diet is a 500 calorie a day diet. And when they look at exercise intervention, they'll do something like a 300 to 500 calorie workout. And so they'll say, wow, <laughs> if you have 500 calories a day, you'll lose far more weight than if you exercise. And most papers rely on this type of comparison. Um, not a fair comparison, arguably. If you look deeper into the research, you'll see that increasing aerobic activity reduces visceral fat, central adiposity is reduced. You may actually have weight gain because you're building lean muscle mass, especially if you're resistance training. That is usually not taken into account. Um, but the best combination is really a healthful diet and exercise for long-term success. What about mitochondrial function? What are the effects of exercise? So the only mechanism to increase the size and volume of muscle mitochondria is movement. For younger adults, for older adults, you can have an almost 70% increase in energy production. Um, the first workout somebody does after being sedentary is 154% increase immediately in mitochondrial function. And uh, in terms of the most, most effective exercise, usually high intensity inter interval training and resistance training are the most uh, effective. Reducing blood pressure. So the world's biggest silent killer is hypertension. Um, exercise has been proven to reduce blood pressure in the long term, but in the short term there's an increase in blood pressure, both in aerobic activity and resistance training. And the reason being is the heart is strengthened, there's a greater efficiency cardiovascularly, and you have a 50% reduction in hypertension if you regularly exercise. Moderating stress, does it make a difference? Um, aren't we all getting stressed out with lots of physical activity? Well, in most cases, and with the right types of physical activity, you do have an elevated 
cortisol and adrenaline response, again, in the short term. But chronic exposure to exercise will reduce cortisol. It calms the body. It helps the body deal with stressful situations. So most research points to success in managing stress, chronic stress, based on physical activity. Stress. I worked in a really demanding job, some of you know. <laughs> I worked in investment banking. I was really successful. I was one of a handful of technologists around the globe who could make banks shed loads of money, lots of money. I was working 16 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week. I was pretty much on call 24 hours a day. And I decided, well, I had to get, I had to get fitter. I had to change my diet. So I went into a gym and started doing really stressful <laughs> performance-based exercise. So I took my hard work, performance-based work ethic into a gym environment and I struggled with injury. I struggled with a lack of enjoyment of the work that I was doing. Um, and that wasn't a very good prescription for myself. And that's why I had to change my approach. What about inflammation? So doesn't exercise increase inflammation? And the answer is yes, it does. It does increase inflammation, but only in the short term. So that short term response of inflammation tends to be DOMS, delayed onset of muscle soreness. Um, interleukin-1, beta, is increased. Uh, tumor necrosis factor, alpha, is increased. These markers are markers of inflammation. They're all increased in the short term. CRP increases in the short term. But long term, interleukin-6, which can be pro or anti-inflammatory, actually drives down systemic inflammation. So the long-term effect of physical activity is a driving down of CRP, tumor necrosis factor, alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and so on. So it's really interesting when people complain about the fact that there may be aggravating inflammatory responses through activity. It's about choosing the right types of physical activity. What about gut health? I had no idea <laughs> that physical activity could actually promote healthy gut flora and microbial diversity. I had no idea. I believed it was just about food, kimchi, kombucha. Um, but actually, there is some research that physical activity affects the gut microbiome, the diversity of the gut microbiome and health-promoting bacteria. And some of the research compares a group of rugby players and on a controlled diet and they found that the fittest rugby players within a team had greater microbial diversity. And they attributed that to uh, their VO2 max. So it's purely to do with their aerobic level of fitness. And that VO2 max discrepancy or difference could account for 20% uh, increased diversity and variation in diversity, um, which is quite interesting. Secondly, which is kind of my theory behind this is, especially playing rugby, you have more exposure <laughs> to soil-based organisms and the like. Um, but, you know, it's interesting that you can affect microbial uh, fun function through movement. What about improving health span and longevity? So, um, some of the kind of markers for aging that we're aware of, like telomeres and the uh, hormones such as irisin, which is known as the kind of exercise hormone, are all improved. Telomere length improves based on physical activity. And uh, again, there's some really good uh, research out there around that. If you're going to look at this, have a look at irisin, uh, the, the, the hormone irisin, known as the exercise hormone. And it's tied into longevity and healthy aging. And those who are fitter aerobically, you can have a nine year difference in biological aging, uh, just based on a difference in levels of fitness. Improving mood, um, it affects all of the feel-good hormones, physical activity. You know, endorphins, as we're all aware, is a natural painkiller. Um, <laughs> we get an endorphin rush because we pretend to do a, a lengthy physical uh, set of activity, and we need that type of response to let us know that we should be feeling good about this. So we get dopamine, oxytocin, especially when we have tactile 
physical activity, and there's improvement in mental health outcomes, those who are physically active. So mood, yeah, so I, I experienced this myself uh, last year. So my sister passed away in 2016, 39 years old. She died of, of cancer, uh, some of you know this story. And I basically stopped pretty much everything that I, that I could do in relation to living a healthy lifestyle, stopped on the day my sister passed away. I started eating rubbish food, I started becoming extremely sedentary, I fell in love with my Xbox, <laughs> Xbox One, and I was playing computer games pretty much from rolling out of bed all day until three, four in the morning, and I'd repeat the cycle. And um, I didn't, didn't let anyone know about this behavior, and if anyone spoke to me, I was like, yeah, everything's fine, yeah, everything's okay, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing okay, but I, was, I wasn't doing okay. And even though I knew me not exercising was making my mood worse, I still couldn't get out of bed and become physically active. And I was waking up at one o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock in the afternoon. It was an awful period of time for me. And what turned that around was one day I went to my local gym, which is my local park, um, and I was like, this is why I should be out here enjoying what I do. And so movement became enjoyable because I was in a natural environment and I recognized I needed to do this for my mental health. That was why, and I needed to do this now. So it took a significant amount of time, but it was an amazing euphoric moment when I recognized there was a way of me enjoying life again um, through movement. What about blood lipid, lipids and cardiovascular risk? So again, often we're told it's just really all about our food. It's all about carbohydrate intake. It's all about, some would argue, saturated fat intake. But regardless, food tends to be the main focus when it comes to triglycerides, when it comes to good and bad cholesterol, when it comes to lipoprotein A, when it comes to particle size, when it comes to inflammation around cardiovascular risk. Homocysteine is a cardiovascular risk uh, marker, um, in, infl inflammatory marker, and uh, physical activity basically improves all blood lipid biomarkers. Every, every, anything you can think of. LDLP count, particle size, uh, levels of inflammation, homocysteine levels are reduced through physical activity. Lots of research in, in that area. So it isn't just about food. What about sleep quality? Again, studies show that exercise leads to better sleep patterns. You're less likely to be an insomniac less likely to have other sleep disorders if you're physically active. And the earlier in the day that occurs, the more likely it is to stimulate restorative sleep. So serotonin is activated at the start of the day, when you're outdoors especially, and when you're physically active. That's what the body was primed for. Improving brain health and cognitive function. Um, it helps everything from children academically, those who are sedentary, studying, don't perform as well as those who are given regular breaks, learning less, but actually achieve more academically. To those middle-aged individuals who are less likely to suffer from cognitive decline because they're physically active. And the driver for this is something called BDNF, which is like a kind of fertilizer for the brain. And movement is the only way to promote neurogenesis, the growth of new brain cells. It doesn't come through brain training, it doesn't come from Sudoku or crossword puzzles. It only comes through movement. Brain training will retain the neurons that you have in the brain, but movement, especially new, interesting, improvisational movement, creates increased brain volume and, in, and neurogenesis. Blood glucose control. So um, after exercise, your blood sugar levels drop up to 48 hours after physical activity. Insulin sensitivity is improved, whether it's aerobic activity or resistance training. The best combination is resistance training and aerobic activity, and um, insulin resistance risk reduces, type two diabetes risk reduces, you're twice as likely to suffer from metabolic syndrome if you're sedentary. Um, and what was really interesting for me looking at this is 70 to 90% of our glucose requirement is about muscle tissue. 
70 to 90 percent. So when you're being told that excess circulating blood glucose gets converted into fat when insulin isn't doing its job, that only affects 5 percent, <laughs> 5 percent adipose tissue is affected by that because 70 to 90 percent of the requirement is muscle mass. But if you're sitting down, if you're sedentary, that 70 to 90 percent needs to go somewhere. So just physical activity alone is a remarkable way to manage blood glucose and there's lots of studies supporting, supporting this. And what's also interesting is there's a transporter called GLUT4 which doesn't need insulin to force blood glucose into cells, especially muscle cells. It doesn't need insulin. So just movement alone without insulin can be supported through physical activity. So finally, looking at discussing all of that, why is movement really important? And there's some really great research looking at the development as to why we had to move. And so the common sense one is, well, if we didn't move, we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't feed, you know, we couldn't reproduce. There was a driver for movement. And this gentleman here proposes that actually our cognitive ability and cognitive function is purely driven by movement. That's all it is. Us thinking, us being able to create iPhones and great technology is driven by our ability to move, our ability to consider what will happen if my movement is unsuccessful. If we get to place B and there isn't food there, what will we do next? Um, so an intention to move, predicting all of the possible outcomes, and then acting upon that is really what our cognitive ability is about. So to summarize, what are some of the risks associated with a sedentary lifestyle? So I put this together, and uh, it basically covers all of the research I could find on how physical activity and movement benefits us. And there pretty much isn't anything, anything at all about the human body that doesn't respond well to movement. reduction in all causes of death, all cause of mortality. So, movement is medicine. And that music was mine, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so um, movement is medicine. So, I'm going to go back in time now. Uh, as I said earlier, I was a computer programmer, I was a technologist working in investment banking. This is how it all started for me. In 1979, my mother came home with an Atari computer. And I was really upset because it wasn't a games console. I was like, mom, there's a keyboard. What, what the heck's that? I want to be playing games. And she went, I don't know. The salesman told me it was a really new and fantastic product. And you can plug it into the TV and you can, you can touch type. Mm, that sounds interesting. So I, <laughs> so I learned to code on that machine right, that, right there, the Atari 400. And um, back in those days, you had to load computer programs via cassette tape, and you'd be waiting there, waiting for it to be successful or not. It would take 30 minutes to load, and it was oftentimes unsuccessful. But at that stage, I spent more and more times, more time being sedentary. And that's what I did when I was working within banking. That was a long time ago. <laughs> um, I had four monitors. I was really successful, which meant I had more than just one or two. And by the time I left, I had nine monitors. And, and you, it was literally almost like a status symbol, um, the more monitors that you had. And I had more monitors than anyone else. I was surrounded by, by monitors. But I was also extremely sedentary. So what are the recommendations? What can we do about this? For your kids, they should be getting at least 60 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous activity. 60 minutes a day. For adults, from 18 to over 65, it should be at least 150 minutes per week. 
at least two of those days should be resistance training. So if you're just running or just doing yoga, it's not enough. If you're just in the gym, it's not enough. You have to have this composite of resistance training and aerobic training. If you're an older adult, you should be also incorporating coordination and balance, dancing and the like to improve function. But there isn't a reduction in the requirement for 150 minutes a week. What about, what does the research tell us? It tells us that 35% of UK adults, 21% of U US adults are meeting the requirement. When we wear an accelerometer, only 5% of adults meet the requirement. So basically it means we lie when we're self-reporting about our physical activity uh, requirements. And it's the same for kids as well, unfortunately. Not many children are getting enough physical activity. 8% of kids, it's just ridiculous. It's scandalous. Um, what does moderate activity mean? It basically means if I have trouble talking whilst performing physical activity, that's moderate activity. If I have problems uh, singing, that tends to be vigorous activity. So that gives you an idea. So just to let you know, this right here is not, doesn't count as my 150 minutes. This right here is doing pretty much nothing for me apart from me getting up out of my chair and walking a bit, a bit of locomotion. But it isn't meeting the baseline health requirement for moderate intensity activity, just to let you know. Um, how much should we be doing? There's great research that the sweet spot for the amount of physical activity per day is between one and a half to two hours a day of moderate intensity activity. After that, it can become problematic. After that, it can increase the risk of chronic inflammation and the like. But most of us should be aiming for that sweet spot of one and a half to two hours. Here uh, is some evidence of me <laughs> kind of collating what happened in Iowa recently when I went out during the day, a summer's day, I didn't see any kids playing. And I walked for about an hour and a half, and I saw no kids playing, none. And when I asked a few adults, they were like, yeah, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, kids were out playing, but we'd th just rather stay inside. Um, then I started to think about being a pedestrian, and I saw these signs saying, you know, making it difficult for you to cross the street. And I used this walkway, and I literally had to run across the road because the countdown was so quick. <laughs> I was like, there is no way I'd want to do this on a regular basis. It was a hazard for health. Then I saw signs like this telling me, oh my gosh, there's going to be a walking man and it's quite dangerous. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I've seen kangaroos in Australia on signposts and deer, and, but like, I've never seen a walking man. Um, and I was like, I'm in a really nice neighborhood, so I know there were no safety alerts. Uh, this is just watch out for pedestrians, and I was one of them, <laughs> okay? Um, then I saw this, which was, I, I don't know what the heck was going on here, a drive-through ATM. So I actually thought I saw a petrol pump or a gas pump until I saw somebody drive up and actually collect some cash, and I was like, people can't even get out of their cars to get a bit of money, and they're celebrating the fact that you don't have to get out of your car, and you can drive up and collect some cash, a grand opening celebration in August, now available. Uh, ridiculous, so what should we do? We should focus on getting fit, F-I-T-T, be functional, have integrated movement, make sure it's transformative, make sure it's therapeutic, it should be powerful, it should be practical, it should be playful. Primal play. And before we close, physical inactivity can be detrimental to your health. Before, before beginning any program of physical inactivity, you should always consult with your doctor, particularly if you have a history of a healthy body composition or any type of medical condition that might be worsened. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so if you like what I do, if you want to find out about a playful, enjoyable, effective approach to movement, please visit my website at primalplay.com. You can download a free book. You can take part in a free e-course that I have. And please connect with me on social media. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daryl. OK, we have some time for questions. Uh, but I think we only have one microphone. So oh, is there? It doesn't look like it. Well. If you have questions, you can head over this way. Is it there? Okay, I couldn't see it.
Just a question about the, um, the movement. Uh, it was interesting that maybe the reason we move is to, for cognitive function, but I couldn't help think of um, you know, people like Stephen Hawking or uh, someone like George R. R. Martin, very powerful, powerful brains, creative people. So are they just outliers where the lack of physical activity doesn't affect them? Or is it just that were they more active, they'd be even, their, their minds would be even more powerful? I mean, that's a really interesting point. Um, I suppose with Stephen Hawking, obviously he wasn't always suffering from motor neuron disease. Um, it was only, I think it started occurring in his early 20s uh, whilst at university. So, so that, that research was purely about a, the, the evolutionary driver um, and how we're still impacted by that. So just um, the, an action in itself um, is driven by a desire to move. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of all part and parcel. There's again, lots of interesting research in, in relation to that. But from a common sense point of view, again, like if we couldn't move, you know, we couldn't get optimal food sources. You know, it's all, all of us as mammals or any, anything in the animal kingdom is driven by movement of some description. So it kind of just makes, it really does make sense to me. But uh, yeah, it doesn't really answer the question. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, creativity, yeah, I, oh, here's, actually, I do have an answer for you. Um, if you look at the leading tech organizations, uh, the companies that seem to be the most innovative, the companies that are the most disruptive, um, they reduce the amount of work time per day and increase the amount of play time because they recognize it produces more ideas, more innovation, more creativity. So I would argue <laughs> that yes, you'd become far more creative and make far more impact when you're given the freedom to move and to play. Imaginative exercise? Yes, yes, arguably, arguably so, for, for sure. Yes, yeah, so, okay, hey, let's everyone stand up. Stand up, 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 stand up. We've got another question. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. <laughs> okay, so right, so um, can I have a volunteer quickly? Okay, Anne, nice. okay, Anne. All right, so, all right, so we're gonna, so we're gonna play uh, sticky shoulders. So, hand on my shoulder, hand on my shoulder. Basically, keep it there. Okay, keep your hand, <laughs> keep, it, keep it there. Okay, so, all right, so, start thinking about this now, don't struggle being concerned about what I'm going to do next, just keep in contact, okay? I'm not moving very quickly, but what I want you to do, stay in tune, whatever I'm doing. <laughs> Good. So movements like this will generate innovation and creativity. Uh, so give this, I think everyone should give this a try, wherever you are. Sticky shoulders. <laughs> Wherever you are, give that a try. I know you're limited by space, some of you. Come on, Tess. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Do you have another? It was, it was a one, but you can do two. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so this, this movement right here, if you had an fMRI scan, you would see the amount of neurons that would be fired by this kind of cross-pattern movement. Okay, this multi-directional movement. So there are more neurons that are fired by this type of movement than me just kind of running in a straight line. Okay, the fact that I'm not really sure what's gonna happen next. The fact that we have to be imaginative and creative and move our bodies in really interesting ways, which is why dancing really helps older adults in terms of improvements of cognitive function for them, because you do have this improvisational aspect to movement. Any more questions? Sorry. Hello. <laughs> oh, I, I just wanted to come over and stand but, next yeah, to you. Yeah, you can run over anyway. So, 
So my, my question probably won't lead to as much fun. But uh, movement in pregnancy, uh, even though the research clearly shows that moving in some form is better than not moving, um, sedan a sedentary lifestyle is basically encouraged. I am told to sit and put my feet up and, and because lifting five pounds might cause some sort of problem. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have information on that or ways to encourage, because there isn't a program, and they basically say, we don't know if it's safe to move, therefore don't move. Um, I, I was in India earlier this year, a um, fairly remote part of India, and I remember seeing uh, this uh, lady, um, about eight months pregnant, um, and she had like a hat made of all sorts of objects on her, on her head. <laughs> And, um, and she was walking up a really steep incline, and I had somebody who could translate for me, and uh, he asked her, like, you know, where did you start, how long have you been walking for? And she's like, oh, it was about six miles at the point where she, where she was at. And I, and I asked if I could put these kind of whatever it was contraption on top of my head, and I kind of like, I nearly crushed my skull. And <laughs> it was like really, it was basically very, very heavy. And when she was walking, she had an amazing pos posture. So I would argue, the evidence is right there. You know, in most parts of the world, women don't slow down because they're pregnant. They don't reduce the type of physical activity that they do. So obviously, it's, 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 it depends on your physical state and condition throughout pregnancy. But for most, I would say more movements would be better than, than less of the right types. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we have this rise in gestational diabetes and preeclampsia when we don't let pregnant women move. So. Ex exactly, I agreed, agreed. And you don't, have, unfortunately, you don't have to be pregnant. You know, if we're <laughs> if we're kids, yeah. If your kids, we're told not to move. If you, you know, what I mean, stop move, Johnny. Get get back here. Get off the ground. Stop moving. It's not, you know, it's not good for you. Stay in your high chair. You know, we're we're told all the time, don't move. It's dangerous. The stairs in the London Underground where I live, you know, there are warning signs saying don't take the stairs, because it's gonna hurt by the time you get to the top of it. <laughs> So that's the reality, folks. <laughs> I'm too lazy to run a cracker room, am I? Uh, my wife's an antenatal tutor, and uh, she gets asked this sort of thing as well. And she's actually looked into the proper research, and actually it, some physical activity will lead to far better labor experience and an easier labor, and often even a shorter labor. And in fact, she encourages amongst her students that women do start to do some physical activity. Obviously, if you're not used to doing a major amount of physical activity, don't go and suddenly start doing high impact CrossFit or whatever. Because as she says, if, you're going, if you intend to do labor and you're sedentary, it's like being sedentary for nine months and then suddenly being told to run a sub uh, four hour marathon. That's about there. And you would never do that. Labor, it's, it, it's not called sitting down and having fun. It's called labor for a reason. <laughs> so, it, you know. Great point. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for that, Daryl. Um, just a question on your recommendations on uh, exercise intensity level. How much focus do you put on heart rate? Like in terms of aerobic threshold or, you know, uh, you know, just do you find that's a factor when you're making recommendations to your clients? Um, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so um, when I started getting into physical fitness, I was, it was all about the numbers, all about the metrics, training, you know, anaerobic threshold, lactate threshold, all that sort of gubbins, heart, vari heart rate variability and the like. Um, all I do and track personally now is probably my resting heart rate alone, and that's what I would do with my, with my clients. Um, and the, the, the greatest emphasis is on the, a variety of physical activity um, and activities that are the most effective. So that's for that one and a half hours, you're not concerned with them training a little bit too hard and kind of producing those stress hormones that are maybe exasperating some of their problems? Um, yeah, for most people, they, they don't. Uh, the people who tell me that they overtrain, you know, there's usually other things happening. So a bit, a bit like myself with my work, you know, what I was doing in the gym wasn't really the problem. It was the fact that I was really hyper stressed out anyway. And then I'm doing a little bit of physical activity, which is also stressful and it tips me over the edge. So for most people, once you start regulating other aspects of your life, um, there are not many people who are doing too much physical activity. I mean, they're outliers, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, even with elite athletes who do die 
usually before sedentary adults in the US. Um, it's usually because of things like concussion. That's the reason why. It isn't because their heart has packed in, or do you know what I mean? Or they've been working too hard physically. It tends to be the other risks that are associated with, the, with, with certain sports. So it takes an awful lot to do too much physical activity. We just need to make sure we have the right variety and then we'll always stay within the kind of safe zone. So pretty much everyone playing that game earlier, for example, that was relatively high intensity interval training right there. Um, <laughs> you know, it was aerobic, there was coordination, there was some balance going on. Um, you know, there's a lot we can do without being too concerned about uh, potential risks, which aren't really, aren't really there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.